Checkout Tracking by the NPD Group brings you a receipt collecting system that gathers data anonymously through technology we created, providing your businesses with answers So, briefly, uh, thank you all for coming. My name is Dave Rural. Uh, sitting next to me is the far worse looking Steve Moretzky and the far less charming Juan Grill. Uh, so, for about six years, we've done a series of lectures at Casual Connect and GDC on uh, design trends in free play markets. And uh, this year is an experiment. We decided to work with the, the organizers of Casual Connect to redo this as a series of roundtables, a series of group discussions where rather than just sort of pulling from our own brains, we will pull wisdom from your brains because we like wisdom pulling and you all have it. Uh, this is the fourth in a series of four roundtables. Uh, so we started with one on saga style games, uh, level based puzzle games did one on Social Casino. We just did a half hour on Midcore Mobile. Uh, and this is our half hour for everything that is not those. Uh, the remaining genres, categories, developments, as well as general market trends. Uh, so we would love to get some of your thoughts, some of your questions, some of your experiences working outside of those three areas in free to play. Um, this is being videoed and recorded, so when you want to talk, please grab one of those microphones and introduce yourself before the first time you speak, uh, your name and who you work for. And uh, do you want to kick us off with a topic, Juan? Sure. We, we left the last half an hour because we felt that, obviously, uh, not everybody works on the three uh, genres that uh, we discussed in the previous uh, hour and a half. Um, so uh, we thought a couple of topics. I'm going to throw one and see how how, uh, how it goes and uh, engage some interest. And, and, and please let us know if this is a particular topic that we should be talking about that was beyond the three genres uh, that we talk about. Um, a, a, year and a, a year and a half ago, I became obsessed with micro games. And those of you who came to my cash for game presentation a year ago saw that I focused um, a significant amount of time on them. And also on my GC presentation, it was exclusively about micro gaming. So from Flappy Bird onwards, success of Crossy Road, the success of all these different games and publishers like Ketchup. Um, having said that, a year and a half later, um, the only guys who have been able to make it successfully is Ketchup. And, um, a, 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 or what the, what the one hit wonders, right? Uh, and, and granted, I give a lot of credit to the guys who make Crossy Road, uh, but it's just one title. What's that? What's I said, how about Smule? Smule? Yeah. Yeah. No, no, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Um, and um, uh, basically, um, I'm wondering uh, is if it's uh, the success of micro gaming is completely tied to the promotion of the, uh, the App Store, or is that there's a true interest from, from, from players? And what's the relationship to uh, um, a, the, the games that are on the top downloads, on two free downloads uh, right now? So if anyone has any thoughts about that. I mean, I think a lot of the, you know, the challenges right now in terms of uh, micro gaming and, and driving top grossing just kind of have to do with the attention cycle and the business yeah. model, right? I mean, yeah. these are inherently games with fairly short lifespans. They're yeah. pl people play them intensely. They love them. They have a great time with them. Uh, then they're done with them and they move on pretty quickly. And that just means on a per user basis, it's hard to you know, ec extract the same kind of revenue that you can from a mousetrap that's built to engage a player two, three, five years, yeah. right, at its best. So I think, you know, ultimately they just struggle to really show in the, in the top grossing. Yeah. No, and, uh, and I think, I think the, 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 the fact of, of generating an additional download to start playing another game, that, that has created a huge barrier. Uh, I think uh, uh, that's why only Ketchup has been able to be successful with this, I guess. Um, because the, the, there's almost, at least from what I have seen on, on my stats, uh, a, a, the, the, 
number of people who download your next game uh, is not as much as you will hope. So there's no virality effect on the cross promotion as effective than other other techniques. It seems to me. Uh, but I was curious if somebody made it work. I, I was thinking that one way to make uh, micro games work is a portfolio play where you have many games like yeah. Tab does, and you're cross promoting between them. And I was hoping to hear about best practices of like ways to make that cross promotion work, or kind of right. what kind of plumbing you need in each game to connect them all together. And it sounds like you've built some of that, and it wasn't very effective for you. It wasn't very effective. I'm I'm wondering if the next thing. I think I think that the 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 thing that is sorely lacking is the fact that they don't build community. The, the games itself don't build community. And I think if they would build community, if, like I go back to um, Twin Galaxies, for example, just to, to, because most of micro games are arcade games. So I go back to, and, and most people I have talked to, they play for the high score. They play Crossy Roads for the high score. They play um, uh, Flappy Birds for the high score. And um, I look back at Twin Galaxies, for example. I, I, is everybody familiar with what Twin Galaxies is? Okay. All right. So basic, uh, Twin Galaxies is a website that keeps tracks of the records on classic arcade games. So they have a referee. They have somebody who watches the whole video. So if somebody played for 40 hours, they watch the whole video of somebody playing 40 hours to certify that that person did 40 million points in Donkey Kong. And um, uh, it is a huge community of people who follow Twin Galaxies and, 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 and being the number one record holder has a lot of street cred and, and, and we have even seen it in popular culture with the movie Pixels. Um, so um, uh, I feel that, that maybe, maybe the solution is to have a meta app that contains all these games and, and constant updates could bring you new games, but there's a community around the people who are playing that specific game. But uh, I'm just curious about what other people think. I guess one question about the community idea or the, you know, kind of concatenating many of these into a single app or experience is, you know, are all of these games appealing to the same group of people? I mean, certainly with, say, you know, slots games, you know, right. pretty much everyone yeah. who likes one slots games is going to like another. Right. But uh, my feeling is it's not, that isn't necessarily the case. It's someone who likes one of these micro games is, you know, going to like the other nine that you're offering in, in your concatenation. Yeah, it is kind of interesting that this is a strategy that, you know, sort of really worked on the web, right, where you could do strong portal aggregation in, you know, places like Pogo or yeah. MindJolt, right, and they're, they're kind of a Facebook offering that no one has been able to make, you know, work on mobile at all. Right, uh, and there have been a couple of stabs at it, and I'm not sure if that's just because, you know, the loyalty systems haven't been properly built, or the notification pull from new games launching isn't as strong. I, I don't have a clear hypothesis. Um, but it is super interesting that it worked, you know, on the web. Uh, to your to your point, I think there is a there's, there is a, a high correlation on the majority of the micro games in terms of they are all about games where dexterity and quick reflexes are are are, are the, the the main form of interaction and they are all score based. Uh, the majority of them are score based. So there I, there there is a, a, t a, a type of player who consumes uh, those games versus playing puzzle games. I mean, the, the, the true majority of the micro games are a, a Twitch based, uh, a, and I would say 20% of them are maybe puzzle game based. Uh, so, yeah, the, the, um, in that sense, I feel that the, there is a correlation between uh, all, all of them. But, but it seems to me that um, uh, there is a, a, a contradiction in terms of, of, of the value of the game itself versus the, the, the death of the, co of, of the mechanic. Because um, a, if we look at the, and, and maybe I'm wrong on this, but uh, I look at the game design uh, for arcade games, um, and they, they were several axes of operation. And the fact that they were, even though the games were simple, because there were several axes of operation, up, down, left, right, uh, a, a one, two, three buttons, um, they were, several ways of actually interacting with the game um, uh, versus one-tap games might not 
even though it can be addictive and popular, they might not create enough depth in order to create a community around them. But I don't know what people think about that. I mean, the, the only thing I can add is like, I don't know if you guys know, but we're doing the next game with the Crossy Road guy is going to be Pac Man themed. So they're building yes. the game, but it's Pac Man, like you go through the arcade, et cetera. Pac Man oh. 256 comes out in the next uh, few weeks. So the, yeah, that was just trying to learn from that. Uh, I think that's, that's you know. Yes, it's a pretty good idea, I think. But like, you basically try it out and see what happens, what we can learn, and then iterate from that. But at least we're trying, I guess. And the balancing, I'm, I'm just curious because I saw in the video that, uh, and from from the from what I could see in the video, it seems that the balancing of of Pac-Man uh, 286 is is more like uh, a, 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 a more casual pace than what uh, a Pac-Man is. is am, am I correct in that assumption? I saw that the player was able to go through the maze, and because of the fact that it's a continuous maze versus uh, a, a enclosed maze, the role of ghosts is, uh, is, is different. Uh, it, was that uh, on purpose? Or? Yeah, basically I had to figure out like how to make that game work, right? So it's different, uh, cool. based on the same principles, but like a different, because uh, yeah, the, 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 the whole point of the game is different. Yeah. That's great. That's great. No, I, I'm, I'm really looking forward. Um, so to start a new topic, um, one of the differences that I've seen when doing this analysis compared to a year or two ago uh, is the great shrinkage of the builder genre. I mean, a couple years ago, you know, I would have said, you know, there's really four pretty dominating genres in free-to-play games, and now, you know, the builder category has sort of shrunk to, you know, the place where it's you know really not a, an equal category with with the other three big genres, and um, you know we've seen uh, a lot of the the classic builder games like Farmville and Heyday uh, start to drop down the list, and and a lot of ones that had been on the list like uh, The Simpsons falling off, and on the other hand, um, King just announced their first builder game. So uh, anyway, I'm just sort of curious to get people's thoughts on what's going on with the builder category. Has it run its course? You know, have players just got tired of it? You know, or is it still a popular category, but companies are just shying away from it because kind of the cost of entry is so high? I mean, uh, the, uh, the, the thing that uh, it's funny for me is like game, like the this kind of analysis like you look at the market right and then you say oh these guys are on top so I'm gonna do that that's kind of enabled by the leaderboards that are, uh, exist right so like I remember the Facebook days like everybody wanted to make the high DU games because that's what Facebook posted the list right like there's no ghosting list in the beginning so like everybody was trying to make the most casual game possible because they're going for DAU uh, and there's a lot of like actually really successful core games at that time but nobody heard about them because there's they nobody could find them like there were, there's no leaderboard for them uh, therefore, like all the first few years of Facebook games are all casual, casual, mass casual, like masses casual. Uh, and then, of course, the, the with the grossing because the grossing is here, then people will follow those things, right? So then, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I remember like uh, when I was at EA uh, a couple of years ago, we had uh, four big pillars, and it was like casual, four construction, which is like a way to call builders, and casino, which is like four, like pretty mm -hmm. much four genres. So that was definitely a big. Uh, focus back then yeah. um, I'm not sure what it is now but like I, I honestly I don't look at like uh, for at least for our games like I don't look at that anymore because I don't think portfolio building is that important uh, like really what you want to do is like have a good game that has a real shot and I really don't care which genre it's from so like I, so I try to look at the best plan I can build based on the teams I have the IP I have and uh, like the strengths from my team and I just try to do that and I, I really don't care about uh, like genres and portfolios anymore in that sense uh, and one thing you mentioned in there actually is IP, right? So one of the interesting things, if you look at this category before it started into shrinkage, is that really everything that hit in the builder category in the last two or three years has had a strong IP attached to it, right? Whether that's uh, The Simpsons or Family Guy or, you know, for that matter, SimCity, right? It really been the builders that have broken through in the last few years. So I wonder, you know, you know, are licensed games the last refuge of a genre? You know, is it? You know, are the the costs of obtaining a, a competing license prohibitive? Are there just not very many sensible ones? But uh, 
So I can talk about Sims a little bit, but you know, Sim City Build is still doing great on the chart actually. Mm -hmm. And but maintaining the game and creating a new contents to keep you know player engaged that's always a challenge. And you know, Sims teams always struggling with like new ideas and what excites players. So we do a lot of user testing in that respect. And you know, it's not just the city and items you can purchase in the you know building aspect. It's a you know, about the characters, like, it's kind of funny that, uh, you know, if uh, this character marries this other character, what's their kids look like? So people are more and more interested in, like, you know, it's in-game, but a somewhat realistic experience within the game, so those are always challenges. So uh, I, I can talk about Simpsons a little bit, but uh, one, one um, interesting fact about that genre, especially Builder, is that it does take a lot of investment um, in terms of the team, in terms of the content grind that mm -hmm. uh, comes of you know just the players expecting what the next new thing is. Uh, with games like Hey Heyday, where you know you build a, a core system and then you tack on other systems on top, it's more sustainable. But one of the lessons that you know, we've learned in Simpsons is that designing a game to be more of a content grind and, and Simpsons Tapped Out is one where it does take a lot of content to keep that franchise alive and growing. It, it, it does cause diminishing returns over time and uh, it can have a lot of you know, investment that goes behind it. So we talk about profitability, it's you know, the more sustainable genres can, can do better in that sense. Um, but uh, you know, you, I think one interesting fact about builders is um, that you, it's arguable whether builders are as kind of innovative in terms of the features and, and the things that they introduce into the game compared to the other genres. I think that over the last two or three years, there hasn't been as much innovation in the genre compared to others. And you see that you know, games that come out that you know, are successful are still based off of the heyday model of, of builders. And the newer ones that are successful, SimCity is one example of you know, taking some lessons there and growing it. Mm -hmm. And of course, marrying it with a, a great brand and bringing an established core group of players that are familiar with that brand onto a new platform. Uh, but I'm curious to hear the, the group's take on, you know, where, why do you, for one, do you agree with that premise that builders aren't, you know, innovating as quickly as other genres? And two, uh, why? Uh, James, could you pass the mic down? Hi, it's funny, over the last, year I've kind of noticed what I feel like is a bit of a trend that there's a growing focus on PvP content, uh, having players battle other players. And sometimes I think that it's because, you know, people want to enrich the game and add an ed element of competition and there's a certain amount of socialization. And sometimes I look at a game and I honestly think I, that they're being lazy, right? That it's like, oh, well, we can throw in PvP and it's evergreen. And so I feel like there's kind of two sides to that coin. but a builder is a really tough place to put in PvP. And whether it's lazy or whether it's innovation or whether it's uh, socialization, it's definitely something that's in demand right now and it's on the rise. And so I feel like uh, games that can leverage either both single player and PvP or even solely PvP uh, are in a slightly more successful position right now and that may be part of the reason that builders are going by the wayside. In addition to, of course, as the, the aforementioned content load. Uh, I just had a thought, and, it, and this has been on my mind for a long time with this stuff, but I just wonder, do you think that the, the consumer has become savvy enough to say, I've seen enough of these come and go that I don't really want to get invested because I don't believe that it's going to stick around long enough for me to actually get, you know, long-term value out of it? And maybe to, you know, Steve mentioning King doing one, that maybe players, now that King Star is on the rise, they might think, you know, in the back of their mind, like, well, if I get invested in this game, it's going to be around for a while because King is killing it with all these other games. I just wonder if, the, you know, if the, a player's perspective or thought process in that is, is something anybody's done any research on or thought about, like, are, are, are not just burned out, but like, I don't want to get invested because I don't trust that this thing is going to be around, you know, a year down the road. Well, I, I guess my question for you is, um why do you think that that bit of psychology would be more at play in this genre than other genres, right? Just because I, I think so many ha have come and gone 
And you know, in the way that five years ago, that was what everybody was making, and now, not so much. So, you know, and all because I, most of those, you know, dropped off the cliff. So uh, I'm Joey, uh, and uh, with uh, Ben and Efco, and I'm relatively new to the industry. So I'm just curious on everyone's take in terms of, on the more note of like PVP and builders, like. How are we differentiating builders from something like Clash of Clans, which is widely successful, where you do have kind of a building a base aspect, and then you still have that PvP component to it. You know, and it, it, it allows you to play in Clash of Clans. Uh, I think for me, allows people to play solely on their own, just building their base. You can participate in the whole raiding other bases as well. You can participate in the leaderboard if you want. But I mean, how are we differentiating that, and why are we seeing builders aren't successful because you have Game of War, essentially the same thing, building your base. Uh, you have Clash of Clans building a base. So, so I mean, I think the fundamental distinction, at least for me, and why I wouldn't you know, lump these in with either the core builders, the sort of Game of War, Kingdoms of Camelot type, or Clash of Clans is in the case of what we think of as the builder genre, right? Something like Tapped Out or SimCity Build It. The building activity is the game. Right, it is the core mechanic, is sort of expanding, collecting, managing resources, and there's nothing else there. If you look at the kind of other genres of game you mentioned, the core builder or the mobile RTS, um, those genres very intentionally light a fuse, right, when you begin playing and say, look, if you don't want to participate in PvP, your resource production will go negative really quickly, right? So you need to get out there and and raid in order to make your economy go to get the base going. Um, and certainly there's still plenty of interest in mobile RTSs, plenty on the charts, some new ones that have made impacts this year, games like Dominations, right? Um, plenty of folks working on core builders out there, but yeah, just not a lot of- Maybe maybe then it's like the, the matter of, uh, you know, the audience is getting more savvy, right? Like across the board. So I think maybe it's just people getting like, if it's just a pure builder, it's not mm -hmm. interesting anymore. They really want, a builder with something else, right? So maybe that's uh, that, that could explain it, I guess. Uh, an interesting aspect of builders that we've seen to be successful um, is actually the community part, and it goes to what you were saying around PvP. The, the equivalent uh, at builders would be sort of the trading economy and the like real-time trading between players, and there's actually a game in itself for a lot of players. Players engage with that exceptionally well. So. I think you know social and builder haven't really gone past the the Facebook social kind of interactions, mm -hmm. and there's a lot of room for innovation there. And I think once you pick back that uh, pick that back up, and you have more of a value proposition for social and these mobile builders, I think you will see more innovation and more growth there. Um, all right, uh, another topic I'd like to toss out is trivia crack and their use of user-generated content, um, which you know certainly was, was one of the surprise hits of the year. And just wonder if anyone has any thoughts about that, uh, whether the user-generated content was a source of that surprising success, you know, or, or in fact whether that was, whether it succeeded kind of despite their use of the user-generated content. So, you know, one thing I, I will say, uh, just knowing a, a teeny bit sort of third hand about that team is there's a relatively small Argentinian team that put that game together uh, with relatively limited resources, although they may be somewhat less limited now. But uh, I think the game could not have had the, the breadth of catalog and the depth of content that it needed to sustain its rapid expansion without having user-generated content. I think the team had neither, you know, the capacity nor honestly the capability to, to feed that beast. Well, you worked on trivia games at Pogo. What's the sort of database of questions that you need to support a game like that? We failed epically. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, just to be perfectly honest, like, uh, 
Yeah, we put up a, a trivia game that had a base of like 2,500 questions, and then we sort of didn't maintain it because it didn't take off. We just left it up, and people played it. And then a year or two later, we were like, oh, this game still has a loyal player base. We should go and you know sort of liven up the game with another 2,000 questions. And the community was livid. They were enraged because the players who were playing it played this game every day and it had ceased to become a game about general knowledge and had become completely a game about memory and reflex, right? So everybody had kind of memorized the answers to all the questions. It was who could hit the right answer button first. Then we threw in new questions that they had to know and they just hit the wall. <laughs> uh, so communities do funny things. Um, I will say, you know, there's some good databases out there, and I recommend either get your used to do it or partner in with a vendor because it's a very hungry beast, and even with a small community, you're going to need hundreds, if not thousands, of new questions every week to sustain a trivia game. So, and I think uh, Jake has a microphone. I have a microphone. Yeah. Oh, that's I was just going to make a comment on your earlier comment, which is, goddamn players, eh? <laughs> Wouldn't it be great if we didn't actually have to give anybody <laughs> that pay any attention to players? Yes, if the, if the cash bots would just fill our coffers. Yeah, you know? just, just play with your wallets. That's it. So um, I'm sorry to, to interrupt. The only thing I was going to say was uh, it is actually reaching 3 o'clock, and whilst I'm, uh, we're all completely happy for you guys to stay in here, there is actually going to be several burly guys coming in here in a minute to take the tables away. So I just wanted to let you know that there may be people yeah. coming in in a moment. That's all. Well, so as with our other sessions, uh, we're setting up some mailing lists to follow up and continue the discussion. So, you know, if you're interested in sort of hopping on with some smart folks, which is everyone in the room except us three, to talk about design trends and market trends in mobile games, Me drop too. a card. Well, i got to say a coming. tremendous thank you for this. It's been fantastic. Thank you guys for organizing it. This has been great.